So when it comes to adding uh, arbitrary costs for a variety of factors, uh, first we might want to consider what kinds of additional costs uh, that we might want to consider. So if you remember, right at the start, we just had a basic look at a curvature as being a quite a useful kind of way of uh, developing costs uh, for navigating the terrain. And uh, this is great because it helps the pathfinding to avoid taking straight lines uh, or going over sort of ridgy exposed areas. And the inverse could also be true. You could create a pathfinding algorithm that actually prefers going across the ridges and avoids going into the lowland regions, which could be lakes or swamps or whatever you, whatever you want, really. So how would we go about taking this data and any other data and encoding it into the costs array uh, like we do with the slope information? Well, uh, if we go and have a look at the attribute wrangle once more and have a look at the way that we set up the slope cost, we can see that we've already got an example of how we are, are adding flat costs to the terrain. Uh, with the slope cost, uh, it's just getting calculated once for every point, and then we're just adding it to every uh, index of the array for each point. So this means the cost doesn't change based on the direction uh, that you're traveling, uh, which could be interesting, um, it only changes based off of just like being on that point. So, you know, you could go both ways with it. With slopes, it's really obvious why you would want to consider uh, a difference between traveling uphill and traveling downhill. Uh, but with sort of ridgy curvature, like with the curvature of the train, it's maybe less clear why you would want to have a cost to moving onto a ridgy area versus moving off of it. Um, it's probably more likely to be useful to just consider, am I on a ridgy train or not? Okay, so what we can do is we can go back in and sort of reconnect up the, uh, the cost attribute that we've created there. Um, but whereas previously we used an attribute adjust float to uh, add the cost attribute uh, like so, uh, based off of, uh, let's have a look. Oh, actually, we already called it cost. So this was literally just to multiply it. So whereas before we are using the attribute adjust cost, uh, adjust float, we'll get rid of that. And where we, we were measuring the curvature, we were basically directly setting it to be uh, equal to the concavity, which we don't want. So I'm gonna right click that and go revert to defaults. So the measure curvature now is just returning convexity and concavity, which is what we want, it's very useful. Which means now, if we go to our attrib wrangle four, we can go ahead and we can add a couple more costs to it. Float convexity cost, oops, Daisy. Really need to learn to type and we can go as well and do the same thing for the concavity cost okay and what we're going to do for these is we need to just read the attributes um, that we've got convexity and concavity so we can say equals f at convexity equals f at concavity like so and like before, when we have the slope, ascent, and descent, we can also go and multiply that by uh, a couple of parameters. We can call it convexity. Wow, my typing today is atrocious. Convexity cost and CHF concavity cost. Okay, great. And let's go and have a look now at the end result of our pathfinding. I'm gonna go up and turn up the convexity cost, see what happens. Let's go, okay, nothing changed. And the reason is I once again forgot that I need to add it to that costs array. So let's just go ahead and add both of these in. Okay, and there we go. So with the wrangle now, we have the ability to weight the pathfinding and we can see that I'm actually gonna put the descent cost to be equal to the ascent cost for now. And we can see that as I modify the convexity, we're able to sort of guide that curve even more, uh, that pathfinding even more to sort of the regions of the terrain that we want it to follow. Um, so this can be really nice. Uh, and if we were to do the inverse, set it to be concavity, we're gonna see that we now get a pathfinding algorithm which prefers to kind of move along these ridges. Uh, so really interesting. And you can sort of play with these parameters already to achieve a variety of effects. But it's still slightly limiting. And the reason that it's limiting is because we've just, we've predetermined all of the different factors that can influence the pathfinding. And while most of the time this might be enough, uh, it might be interesting to allow the user to also set up custom attributes on their geometry that can influence the pathfinding. So for example, 
uh, if we were to go ahead and um, go back all the way even to the initial height field or the height field noise, there we go. And if we were to go and throw down our height field mask by feature, you can see that we have a uh, slope, which isn't very interesting to us, but we have a height. So we could, uh, you know, we could, we could say that it's inherently more costly to be higher up on the terrain versus lower down. Uh, we could also say that uh, it's inherently more costly uh, to be sort of on one specific side of the hill. Uh, maybe if you've you know, got um, pathfinding that you're doing specifically for gameplay, uh, or you want to consider sort of like uh, snow, snow that's been laid down in direction or you know, prevailing wind directions. And perhaps most interestingly, we have this uh, mask by occlusion uh, as well, which can give us a result somewhat similar to the curvature. Uh, but, but what's nice about the occlusion is that it operates on a variety of different scales. And uh, we can really use this to produce some sort of nice, uh, nice effects uh, on, our, on our terrain that can influence the pathfinding. So we want to be able to pass kind of any arbitrary costing into the system here. So what we can do is we can put down one more called float user cost. We can say equals F at user cost or even, yeah, let's go with user cost or let's go at trip cost, why not? And then we're going to set this to be equal to a, a global multiplier at trip or user, yeah, user at trip cost like so. We'll add the user cost as well, finally, like so. Um, what this now allows us to do, if, if we just go and pump up the user attribute cost to 1000, is we can basically set any attribute, uh, we can provide any attribute to the system and it's now going to be considered and weighted by this user attribute cost. So this allows the user, for example, uh, if we have a look at the uh, the remesh, remesh, sorry, we could go ahead and, uh, for example, we're already calculating the curvature uh, and the concavity. But what we could also do, for example, is we could use uh, any sort of height field mask. So we could go ahead and do height field flow field. Let's put it off to the side. Let that compute. Um, I'm going to go smooth because it's a little bit faster. There we go. Maybe... Uh, a little bit less rain, so we just end up with more of these, a bit more spread iterations. Okay, so now we're getting these kind of like flow lines, and uh, I can use this information to sort of drive the costs uh, as well. So uh, the way I'm going to do this is I'm actually just going to put down another little wrangle to transfer. Uh, you could do this any number of different ways, but the way I'm going to do it is I'm going to put a little wrangle on the remesh. So after this remesh has been generated, I'm going to wire the volume in to the uh, second input there. And remember, we're looking uh, for an attribute that's called f at attrib underscore cost. So we're going to say f at attrib underscore cost equals, and then what we need to do is we need to do a volume sample because height fields in Houdini are volumes. We're looking at the first uh, index one, so that's the second input to the attrib wrangle. So that's one, and the volume name is going to be mask. Uh, and then we need to grab a position. Um, in the, when we're sampling a volume, the position can just be pos equals v at p. Uh, we need to make sure it's a vector. Now, we, this isn't going to give us quite the right result. So just to prove that, I'm going to say a V at CD equals the same thing. So we can see what the result is that we get. And uh, oh, uh, <laughs> maybe I was mistaken. Uh, that actually looks like it's given us the perfect result. So um, I thought I was going to have to do something like uh, set the pos dot y uh, to be equal to zero, um, which gives us the same result that looks like it wasn't necessary. So uh, we're doing the volume sample there and we have this additional cost now. Um, I'm gonna leave the, the color visualization on for a minute. And then if we go ahead and have a look at the end result and sort of play with the user attribute cost, we can see that if we put that up to a thousand, uh, it's gonna be working to avoid uh, those flow lines. I'm gonna turn off the curvature so we can see that it is in fact working. Uh, and we could also do the inverse. So I could say uh, one minus um, and I'm actually going to modify the color to just be directly equal to that attribute so I don't have to keep changing it in two places. And now we can see that it's sort of doing the inverse and it's sort of following those flow lines down. And, you know, now with this ability to sort of uh, incorporate masks uh, of any kind uh, and feed them together into this one attribute cost, 
uh, which then gets weighted in the final kind of like costs uh, calculation, uh, we give the user the ability to do a lot of sort of art direction to sort of their heart's content um, to create whatever kind of pathfinding appearance they would like to create. And uh, if we go ahead and uh, increase the ascent cost as well, uh, increase the descent cost a little bit, um, it looks like the attrib cost is sort of overpowering everything right now. So let's go and turn that down. Just give it a slight influence. You can see there's already quite a big difference uh, between sort of zero and 50. Uh, you can really create sort of a nice variety of uh, interesting uh, different results. Uh, go for a concavity result, uh, 200. Uh, wait and see how far we have to go for that to start overpowering things. Oh, it's currently grayed out. That's, that'll be why. I'm gonna turn off the visualization. And then let's go back and uh, reduce that back down and see what happens if we start playing with it again. The channel, so we can 10, 50, 100. And I think that starts to get a little bit nonsensical, uh, but, uh, but you know, it's kind of fun to play with nonetheless. Uh, you could make a case at this point that uh, it's not really necessary to have the kind of convexity and concavity sort of hard-coded in, or even the slope cost. The only ones that you would really want to be hard-coded in are the ascent and the descent. Um, but I'm gonna leave it here because I think uh, slope, ascent, descent, convexity, and concavity are sort of the nice basic set of parameters you're always gonna want to be able to sort of sculpt uh, your uh, the appearance of your pathfinding. And um, yeah, the user attribute just allows us to kind of go a little bit more crazy. Um, so again, let's have a little play and do a little height field slump. Uh, this is a really good example of something you might want to do actually. So um, I'm gonna do a height field mask by feature, like so. And yep, that's grabbing all the slopes. I'm gonna do a height field slump, uh, maybe less iterations. And what this would allow you to maybe do is sort of grab those regions uh, where there's lots of erosion. Uh, I'm just gonna modify this a little bit to produce slightly more kind of cliff-like, grab the more cliff-like regions, maybe a bit more like that. And then what the height field slump does, yeah, there we go, that's grabbing the cliff like regions. And this is what the height field slump does is it kind of allows us to go, okay, well, there, there would be a lot of erosion in these areas. So these areas probably not so suitable for sort of walking up because you're probably gonna cause an avalanche. Uh, and then if we go and have a look at our end result and wire in our new cost there, and then consider uh, our user attribute cost. Okay, so now we can see that uh, if we were to Okay, it's kind of not showing up. So I guess I need to impact, influence this a little bit more. Uh, oh, we're doing one minus, that'll be why. So it's doing the opposite of what I wanted. Let's have a little look. Okay, I think I want to pump up the strength uh, a little bit. I wonder why that's not coming through very clearly. So let me just try that pos.y equals zero. Uh, there we go. So I did actually need that. I don't know why the, the flow field was working um, when clearly I did want to uh, zero out the Y of that point. So that's why I thought I needed to do that. And now we'll see that in fact, you know, the pathfinding does all sorts of uh, interesting things, trying to avoid uh, going up those heavily eroded areas. And we can sort of weight the extent to which we want to avoid those areas. And that to me looks like it's probably taking quite a sort of believable path uh, right now. Um, and maybe if we play with the spread, maybe that's even better. So we can see that it's really sort of avoiding any areas where there might be avalanches. And uh, yeah, I, I just love playing around with this stuff. Uh, I think it's a lot of fun. Uh, and I'm really excited to, you know, see uh, all sorts of like cool and interesting paths uh, in games uh, as a result of using this kind of uh, approach. So um, what we're going to be looking at next time is sort of consolidating our system, all the work we've done so far, uh, we're pretty much uh, at the end of the Houdini portion of what we're going to be working on, but we're going to assemble everything into a digital asset uh, with some nice parameters and controls. And then we're going to be taking things into Unreal uh, to see, uh, you know, how can we get something uh, from Houdini to Unreal, get the pathfinding kind of tool working directly in engine uh, for maximum kind of iteration speed.